Hello, Keith. Welcome to my tutorial on um, Lidgren networking and the weirdo mistakes that I made during using it. Um, ironically, uh, my internet has been out since we got off Skype pretty much uh, within 10 minutes after that. So um, some sort of cosmic sign? I don't know. Um, <laughs> in reality, Time Warner's doing whatever they're doing. Um, so I'm going to show you some stuff in here, but I'm also going to not show you some other parts that really you should just ignore because there's a mixture of stuff that is good and stuff that is um, my own layer of data transmission and caching and whatnot. And so um, I'll identify those sections, but basically there's really no point in going through them because ideally you will do something much, much better. So um, first of all, um, broadly speaking, I wanna talk about um, the method in which data is sent. Um, there, you know, of course, being two methods, TCP and UDP. With TCP, um, it's reliable and it gets there, but it's slow as molasses. The uh, um, average return time is something like 100 uh, milliseconds a lot of times. It's, it's ridiculous. Um, and part of that is that the underlying network connections have lost packets, of course. And whenever a TCP message gets lost, um, part of it gets lost then it asks for the entire thing back again. And uh, to make matters more fun, uh, since TCP messages are supposed to be sent in order, um, if it gets them out of order, then it tosses them and says, eh, give me that again after you gave me the first one. And if the first one, you know, and so you can imagine how all of that leads to an incredible amount of back and forth of stupidness, whereas really what should happen is the um, client should say, you know, it just takes whatever it's given. And then if it's like missing part three of 37, it's like, hey, I need part three again. And the server, meanwhile, or the sender, meanwhile, waits and set until it's heard, yes, I've got all 38 of these parts before it dumps any of them. And um, so that is not how TCP works, and that is why games don't use TCP. Um, what uh, most network libraries for games are built around is the concept of trying to recreate what I just described, where it's a more sensible um, implementation of what TCP is not. Um, that describes these reliable in-order channels in the Lidgren network, and there are similar things uh, in other uh, network libraries. There's also reliable unordered, um, which basically means it will get there, um, but you don't know in what order it's going to get there. You notice there's only one channel for that in here because there's very few use cases where that is um, actually useful. Um, I honestly cannot think of any where that's useful. Um, unreliable in order uh, is um, something that is a whole lot more useful. Um, unreliable unordered, I see is actually, well, actually, that's just unreliable, that one. That's unreliable unordered. And you'll see there's only one channel there because that actually is fairly not useful as well. Unreliable in order and reliable in order are the two useful types. The reliable in order, it has slightly different names depending on what the network library is, but that's the generality of it. You'd wanna use those for most everything. However, if you're sending something, the typical example is what is the current health of, you know, um, a unit or something, then you don't really care if that message gets there. If you're sending that message, every second or whatever anyway. Um, if you're doing like a clock sync or something, that would be another example because every second you tell them exactly what time it is. And if it doesn't get there, well, it'll get there in another second anyway with a different message. And so you definitely don't want it out of order 
so that it jumps back a second because sometimes it can be delayed even with UDP where it gets a, a resend in and um, and then uh, the data from you know 300 milliseconds ago suddenly arrives in the middle of um, what you're trying to sort out. So a good networking library um, like the Unity networking library, Lidgren, Forge, all that sort of stuff, its goal is to abstract away all of that stuff. Um, then a number of them take it a step further and start getting into things like matchmaking, which we don't care about, like uh, NAT punch through, which we do care about, and which is complicated. Um, and uh, also with things like automatic serialization, which we really don't care about, and automatic syncing of things like game objects and whatnot, which we really, really, really don't care about. Um, in a lot of those cases, when they're doing things like for a general first-person shooter game or whatever sort of Unity title, um, what they're trying to do is automatically allocate different channels of reliable and unreliable in-order stuff to update you on the current position of the player. And actually, position, if you're in a first-person shooter game, is a great thing for unreliable in-order. Um, you know, you're fairly well constantly talking about the position that is changing of the players in a game. If you only have like 16 players, it's not a whole lot of data. So you're talking about that constantly. And as you know from you know Valley One, there's a whole bunch of stuff with like you know prediction and all that. But um, you want to go with the unreliable in order for that, and then for other things that matter, um, that have to do with like score or making sure that like a bullet hit actually registers or something like that, then reliable in order, you know, uh, is is where it goes. So. A lot of these network libraries, um, some of the reviews and so forth that you will see around them center around things like matchmaking and how all of the auto serialization stuff works up and how easy it is to hook up to game objects so you don't have to think about it and how things you know, efficiently get assigned to whatever channels and just go, go, go and blah, 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 blah. These networking libraries are huge by comparison to Lidgren in the scope of what they do. And the great news is that we don't care about any of that stuff. And the great news also uh, is, therefore, that a lot of the bugs that most people would complain about would be in those sections of code. Um, because the underlying stuff that we actually care about is fairly universal. And um, nothing works if this doesn't work. Now, Lidgren had some issues with sending of large data. Um, which I'm not sure, I, I'm not, well, it's an interaction with certain network cards. I can tell you that much for sure, because not all network cards do it given the same circumstances, but a given network card and network card driver will do it repeatedly um, given the same circumstances. So it's definitely a combo bug between um, a network card and Lidgren itself. Um, but whatever was going on with the Lidgren stuff, it was prone to this sort of thing. Um, in Forge, in Unity Networking, in all of that sort of thing, I've heard of no such issues. So I feel like those are pretty safe to go with in any given case. Um, one of the main architectural uh, decisions that happens in most of these networking libraries is what is the host? Is the host also treating itself like a client and talking to itself as if it has a host embedded within it and then it's got a client that talks to it locally? Or is the host um, a uh, entirely separate um, being? I, I, uh, type of entity anyhow than the uh, than the client. Now, uh, most of them err on the, on the side of, let's try and be as consistent as possible for the sake of games. Lidgren wasn't really made for games per se. I mean, it it is and it isn't. It was made much more broadly than for games, whereas this other stuff 
was specifically tailored for games and not much else. Um, so Lidgren unfortunately makes the distinction of uh, the network server and the network client are super different things. Um, and so I had to go in and do the things that say, let's pretend that we're a client uh, on the server as well and act like we're doing the same things we would if we were on a client, but then really it just reroutes it through some local methods rather than you know sending through local host or whatever. Um, which I think one way or another is a good thing to make sure doesn't happen. We don't want single player uh, calls or anything like that to be routed or, you know, or the host calls in multiplayer to be routed through the network card. Um, that's just going to introduce latency for no real reason, even in multiplayer, um, because it's extra churning for the host. Um, the next um, big architectural decision that happens in most of these network libraries is whether or not um, they are based on polling or whether they are based on a secondary thread. And um, Lidgren started out polling based, moved to a threaded model. I had some issues with the threaded model, so I went into its source code and changed it back to a polling model. And um, the polling model has a lot of disadvantages. Um, back when I made the choice, um, there were some reasonable reasons for it. Um, it was still a bit of a toss up even then, but uh, now, now there's absolutely no excuse for doing the polling directly on the main thread. Um, when you do polling, it is generally speaking, actually having to talk through com or whatever to the network card directly and pull some data off of it and as you can imagine that introduces some latency on the main thread on the client um so that's no good um there are um oh there's one other thing which is common to a lot of these which is the ability to discover uh, other clients on the LAN. And so um, that's what the discovery status check stuff is about. And so um, that's one other uh, capability that definitely we want to retain because it's much better if you've got several people on a LAN to be able to do that than to have to say, um, you know, okay, well, what's your local IP? You know, blah, blah, blah. Um, there is a service on uh, whatismyip.com where I think you can literally just make a web request to that and it'll give you back your public IP, which is nice. And um, I, most networking libraries have built-in ways to find your public IP these days, as well as your uh, local IP. And uh, showing those two things um, to the client on like the Find Network Games screen or the host network screen or whatever would probably not be a bad idea because in the event that the land discovery status check fails which really often happens when you're on like a vpn or similar um but it can be caused by firewalls or whatever in general um uh, the discover the land discovery chat status checks used to work a lot better than they do now because firewalls have become more and more aggressive over the last half decade so um the likelihood of those seeding is a lot lower than it was when I originally wrote this, where it was like 100% practically. Um, so being able to show people their IP addresses um, really easily is something that is worthwhile to do in the UI. And again, that should be just the you know, property on the network object of the server of the client um, in these various libraries. Um, very last thing that I would touch on just in a broad, broad sense is that um, IPv4 versus IPv6 support is a pretty nice thing. And um, the older .NET libraries and the older Lidgren libraries often would not recognize an IPv6 address since that's not a three numbers dot, three numbers dot, three numbers dot, three numbers, you know, up to 
Um, and so given those are like lung hex things, um, if it's possible to support that, that's nice, but we've never really had that be an issue and almost nobody uses IPv6 anyway. And, um, but for future proofing, um, if it's easy to flip that on, it certainly would be nice. Um, and most of these, uh, excuse me, most of these libraries do try to go out of their way to make that easy. Okay, so um, what I'm doing right here is polling check, and you're still gonna need to do polling of the other thread one way or the other, so you'll still have something similar. Um, in my case, I'm uh, directly interfacing with Lidgren, which directly interfaces with the graphics card, uh, network card, which is not ideal. So, oh well. Um, this is the AI War um, project, by the by. And um, so there's some errors in here because it's trying to look at the wrong uh, Unity DLLs, not a big deal. Um, so all of these things here, like the net config, net client, net buffer, network message type, um, all of these things are, almost all of those things are Lidgren based. Network message type is something that I created and I prefixed them with C and S so that I would know whether or not to parse these on the client or the server. I recommend that you ignore all of this and not try and recreate what I'm doing here. Um, I think that you will have a much better time if you um, go to kind of the bare metal of this and then rebuild back up what you want versus even trying to understand what I was doing. Um, if it was me, that's what I would do too, because honestly, I don't remember 100% all of the little back and forth things that I was doing. And I also don't necessarily agree with all of the choices that I made before. Now, um, the um, in this particular case, um, the I'll show you the server first. Let's go here first. Um, no matter what, um, I'm treating this as a singleton, and so therefore it's coming up and creating this configuration each time. This is a Lidgren specific thing but I'm going ahead setting up the configuration for networking in case the player wants to use it later. It doesn't really hurt anything if they don't have it. Um, the MTU, maximum transmission unit, honestly, I think you can just ignore that until it becomes an issue. I don't think this is something we wanna deal with. Um, the uh, things like send and receive buffer sizes and so forth, you should be able to leave all that sort of thing alone in any modern networking library that is based around games. Max connections, you can set that if you want to. You want to make sure that it's a high enough number. Uh, one of the things that I will point out is that oftentimes after a connection has been dropped for whatever reason, um, somebody's network cut out briefly or whatever, then uh, the, we'll have kind of a ghost connection hanging around for a little bit and they reconnect and if so if you have like eight slots in the max connections or something and there were eight players um then they may not be able to get back in until that kind of ghost one expires and if it happens repeatedly then it gets extra frustrating so having a bunch of extra open connections is not a bad idea the net configuration in lidgren has a name that is arbitrary, but it has to be the same on the server and the client so that it can make sure that, oh, hey, yeah, we're the same application. I don't know if any other uh, networking libraries do that or not. Um, it's a little bit weird, so I kind of doubt it. Um, specifying a port um, is a really good thing that you're going to want to be able, that you're going to want to do. Um, you should pick something in the 3,000 in the 32, I would say 3,204. <laughs> sorry, 32,400 and something. Pick a number; it doesn't matter. Um, that is typically in the range of where games are, um, and uh, the main thing is conflicting with other games when you're in that range. And um, 
once you've established a connection off of the central port, then it will um, be allowed to use more than one port if you want to do multiplexing or whatever. Um, a lot of uh, um, RTS games use a ring topology where they establish a um, port, uh, you know, a different port connection for each um, combination of client to client in there. And so then that's a multiplexed um, uh, network connection set up. And you have ostensibly a host as the person that's kind of the timekeeper and all that. But in a lot of those cases with those RTS games, if the host disappears, then you can transfer host duties to anybody else because everybody else has all the information. We don't care about any of that sort of thing because none of that is really valid for AI war specifically. So um, ours is really not multiplexing at all. And I can't think of a whole lot of good reasons to use more than one port. Um, using only a single port can be pretty handy uh, in that if somebody is doing port forwarding, then they have less to do. So um, the other thing that's really, really nice is letting them actually change the network port uh, from whatever the default is, because a lot of times they'll run, want to run it over port 440 if they're at work, um, since that is the um, SSL port and no SSL traffic, excuse me, can ever be blocked because uh, it, from like a corporate firewall, at least this was the deal, like you know, half a decade ago, <laughs> nothing in there could ever be blocked because it was all encrypted. And you never knew what it was that was being sent. So application level blocking didn't work. And so if somebody after hours or hopefully after hours wanted to play uh, something from their uh, work location, they could run it over port 440 and nobody would ever be the wiser, basically. Um, so... But there are other legitimate reasons for them to change the port anyway. Um, there's some other things that I have here, like the, I think it was the F2 button, um, where you'd hit F2 and then it would call this string or something similar to that to get a bunch of st statistics about what is going on. Um, I thought that was pretty handy, but, um, you know, you don't have to keep it as F2. It doesn't really need a hotkey per se anyway. Um, and you know maybe shift f3 or something you know um not a big not a big deal um when you're shutting down a server or a client you want to be really really extra sure that you are just like shutting it down in every way possible shut it down dispose it even though you don't necessarily have to make sure every connection is disconnected first like really run the gamut of doing that stuff the reason being that on windows in particular particularly older versions of windows um a port can be left open by an application and then stay quote in use even if the application is shut down and therefore uh, then the game can't proceed on that port, which means they either have to change ports on the server and all the clients, or they have to reboot their machine at the time. They've mostly cleaned that up. I haven't seen that issue in years, but that is one of the reasons that I'm such a stickler for really cleaning up the ports. Mostly uh, Microsoft kind of noticed that was an issue and, you know, um, made it so that if it, it's checking better, you know, hey, is there actually an application hosting something on this port still that's alive, you know, and uh, and deciding no, that there's not when there's not. But um, I, I in general don't, you know, I try not to just put all my faith in something like that. So um, when you're starting the server, there again, um, I do a shutdown check at the start uh, just to be darn sure that that thing uh, wasn't already open for some reason. Um, at, this, at this point, then, um, there are some net message types here, which are, this is Lidgren-based, 
and there's really very few of these, as you can see. Um, and um, looks like he was starting on some uh, network, uh, some nap punch through himself. I think I remember reading that actually. Um, but uh, he has it set up so that via you know flags, you can define which message types are okay to receive. And that was kind of weird, but that's something that you may watch out for. Uh, I, I think that most game based, that was always a little weird to me that it was like, okay, we're going to accept this kind of net message type. Like there are hardly any to begin with. Why do we even, you know, why are you making me say this? Um, at any rate, then creating net buffers, which again are a Lidgren thing, but these net buffers are um, overall something where you can send um, bytes, strings, whatever, and it works a lot like your um, serialization writers. Uh, you could probably hook one up straight to that. Um, a lot of these network libraries have something along these lines. Um, and then, of course, setting the, the port and all that. This is resetting the configuration at the time of starting the server, because one of the things that we want to avoid is if somebody hits um, save in settings and then goes back out and tries to launch the server on a different port, we want that to actually use the new port versus requiring it to be um, uh, a restart of the application before those settings take effect. So hence duplication of that. Um, actually starting the network uh, server from Lidgren, um, there's a bunch of stuff here where I am manually keeping track of whether or not the server is supposed to be running. Um, and then of course I check to see if it's, is it actually running. Um, I think that maybe is a good thing architecturally still to do because um, if you just rely on the network library to say, is it running? Then you don't necessarily remember in code if it's supposed to be running. And so you can always check and see does your, hey, I'm supposed to be running match with the, hey, I actually am running on the on the server of the client to see what's going on. Um, with uh, this check server thing here, this is, um, I used the word heartbeat earlier today, and that actually is a, is a misnomer. That's really not what I should call this. Um, heartbeat is used in two different context sometimes with the networking libraries and that can be confusing and um, sometimes they call it a heartbeat when you're just doing an update check to see if there's new data that's come in through your network card um, and so you know they call it a heartbeat because it's just a per frame or whatever pulse um, ideally it's actually based on some interval of time on a separate thread and so then um, sometimes it's called the heartbeat thread and hooray. What actually a heartbeat is a lot of times is actually a keep alive um, between the server and the client so that it makes sure to send from each of them the server every some number of seconds uh, makes sure and sends like one byte of data to the client it's just to keep alive or a heartbeat and the client's just like chuck it it doesn't you know it sees the message type come in and it's just like yep i i see we're alive still hooray um and the client does the same each client does the same thing back to the server um that does a couple of things for one it makes it so that when a network connection is lost it's figured out much more quickly now that doesn't actually matter when the game is running but if you're if you're in the lobby, um, that can be kind of an interesting thing. If you're talking on Skype or whatever, not really changing a bunch of settings that are going back and forth. There's not really really a whole lot of network traffic, and the network connection can actually time out from not having um, any data going back and forth. And the operating system can decide, huh? Well, I guess we're going to close this port. I don't, you know, I think something's up. There's just nothing happening here. And so um, it's just good practice to send keep alives. I would say every second or two, uh, one way or another, it's just basically 
data that gets sent that is as small as possible, and the other side just takes it, goes, oh, that, and throws it in the trash. <laughs> so um, now uh, with Lidgren, the, let's see, the net message type, this is the Lidgren things, right? Yep. Okay, so I really, really, really don't like the way that Lidgren, uh, the way that Michael Lidgren set this stuff up because he's got a number of different messages and you read a message and it goes into a buffer. That's all very well and good. Um, it's got a net message type and it's also got a net connection sender, fine. Um, what it winds up doing though is asking like, am I an approved connection? Which that is a valid thing to do. And then you can either say approve it or you know disconnect them if if it fails. And then you know that a client is connecting for the first time, so you can run some logic of your own. In this particular case, um, I think these net connection data are my own class. Yep, they sure are. And so in this particular case, I have a bunch of sort of things that you're not going to want to replicate. But at any rate, I've got player names, player number, cached messages. You should be caching no messages. The only reason I'm caching any messages is because I had to in order to get around some of the broken stuff. So this whole player message stuff, um, you should never need that. Um, the connection index is useful in that I'm uh, noting which net connection it is because that can get nulled out. And so, um, although possibly I was being redundant there for some reason, at any rate, um, you're kind of registering what's going on. And in the meat of it, almost everything that's happening is just a net message type dot data. Once you're actually connected, then things become really straightforward at this le at this level. The only thing that takes any work really in the networking section is getting connected. Um, once you're connected, it's pretty much um, here is a buffer of bytes, send it to either this client or all clients, send it to the server or the server uh, if you're on the client side. And that's pretty much it. I mean, uh, all of the rigmarole that goes along with this is in getting connected to begin with and then figuring out who the heck this is and what you should be doing. Now, uh, a lot of the um, ways that I was handling that was based off of the player profile name, making it automatically reconnect the existing. Play so if my name is X4000 and your name is Keith Lamoth. And um, there's an existing multiplayer game that we had loaded, and it had a reference that you were yellow and I was green in there. Then if, um, I don't know, blue is the host, and um, we both connect back in, then it would automatically say, ah, I recognize the profile name you sent me, so I'm going to assign you, Keith Lamoth, to yellow, and I'm going to assign you, X4000 to um, green, I think I said, and we'll proceed from there. So, um, you know, if you don't want to do it based off of that, you know, you could obviously have some sort of GUID on the um, on the other side as well. Uh, you know, like generate a GUID, keep it in the um, game settings. But that gets weird if their game settings get lost and they then are trying to reconnect in. So you have some decisions to make of what happens when somebody tries to connect in with a profile name that you don't recognize. Is this during the lobby? Is this later? What is this? And those are connection, those are, those are questions that I put down in the network layer too low, I think, honestly. Um, uh, those are those are really more kind of game design questions and really shouldn't be um, in the network transport layer. I mean, you do need to know who people are at the network transport layer so you know where to route the messages, but the the least amount of information you can know about them in order to get their message to them, the best, you, you know, the better. So. Um, exactly how you set that up is up to you, but um, honestly, I overcomplicated it. I wouldn't 
suggest looking through mine as an example. Um, it's, I mean, I'd be happy to talk with you about pros and cons of various approaches uh, with that. But I mean, overall, it's just a matter of game logic. Here's a new uh, player profile. This is, you know, Bob Z is trying to connect to the game. Well, what state is the game in? Is it running? Is Bob Z like trying to get into a game that you know he's not invited to? Should we kick him? Like maybe ask the host. Um, is this something that like Bob Z is joining the lobby? You know, and we just go ahead and stick him in the next open slot because we're in lobby mode. I know you've got that built into the regular game now or plan to, and that's fine. But even still, you're going to you know, probably have a flag of this is lobby mode. So when people connect, I kind of take them at their word that they're supposed to be here. And if not, then the host has a way of saying, hip kick, you're gone, Bob Z. Um, and then uh, there's the question of if it's restarting an existing save game, and it's kind of sitting in a holding pattern of, OK, this was Blue, Chris, and Keith in a multiplayer game. But at the moment, it's just Blue is the host sitting there waiting for us to connect in before any turns will be taken. Well, when Bob Z tries to connect, what do you do then? Like, Is Bob Z actually X4000's new name? Or is Bob Z playing instead of X4000? Like. Sometimes that's a legitimate thing. Like we want a new person in or the person changes their name or whatever. So at that point, how do you handle that? That's a, I think a question for the host of like, you know, Bob Z's trying to connect. Like, should this be somebody that's in this list or kick them or what, you know? And um, in the past, I think what I was doing was making it so that you had to go back to the profile name you were using before unless you were in, admin. So if I tried to connect in as Bob Z, I changed my user handle to an old save game and it was multiplayer, uh, then I would have to, oh, oh, you know, Bob Z, you're not in here. And then, you know, Blue as the host could look and go, well, let's see, I've got Keith Moth, Blue, and X4000. I guess you better connect this X4000. I could go, ah, okay. Um, although I do think possibly I had made it so under managed players, the um, host could rename any player uh specifically to get around that problem so that if uh blue's like okay you know bob z who's actually another person is going to be taking chris's place you know from now on because we for whatever reason chris doesn't want to play anymore i don't know uh so um she renames x4000 to bob z she might even change the color whatever under managed players and then bob z tries to connect and boom he's in so that is probably the most complicated part of this whole process is figuring out what to do when clients in a weird in a kind of an unknown state are trying to connect the rest of it is frankly really stupidly simple most of the time <laughs> um the uh, this code right here is for the most part just looking over the connections finding out if they've been disconnected and if so then removing them. Of course, I'm doing a for each, so it's then doing connections to remove. It should just be doing a for int and then just removing them immediately, blah, blah, blah. Um, it's also actually sending cached messages at that point. Um, you may find some value in doing a message cache if you're going to be sending a whole bunch of information all at one go. In other words, you may want to, on the server, have one central kind of byte stream that you're writing to on the main thread that's like, when I get to the end of this frame, whatever's in here, I'm gonna pass over to the network thread and it's gonna do its thing. That way you don't have to lock the network thread for a long time. Um, but that's really the only sort of like caching you should need to do. These cached messages were often based off of, uh, they were partly based off of that concept and they were also partly based off the concept of splitting apart bigger messages um and the, the latter is what you really don't need to do um 
and then there's just some more kind of general uh status stuff here like the outstanding messages um if that got too high then i think it slowed the game down and stuff this was some kind of custom band-aidy sort of code that i had and i don't like it and a lot of that was trying to compensate for clients that were running slower than other clients or the host and fortunately since we have an adaptive frame right now that actually makes the um the um uh, networking side of things vastly easier um so the network calls uh i would make uh be under um under the update call anyway under the update call your actual game logic code that runs at 10 fps is under fixed update i would run the network code under update update is going to run usually way faster than fixed update and it's plenty fast enough um and i i would aim to to pull more from there if it winds up being something you need to switch from one to the other it's not a crisis either way um but that would be my first instinct would be to put that into update um we've got some stuff here where you know when it gets information in it starts delivering it to the server it's it's really fairly straightforward at this point i mean i i almost don't even want to show you more of this stuff because it's kind of like okay you th what else is there to really know when you're making your own thing here you know you get in data it says what connection it's from you've associated that in the manner of your choosing with the player it then is giving you i'm saying a string here but it's giving you a bunch of bytes you then decode that using your own decoding and then you pass that to the server or that client whichever it is it, you know same on both and they then interpret the data as part of the game and that's all there is to it i mean there's things for like hey please pause and you know stuff like that but you've built all that sort of thing before a layer above where i built the same stuff but that's fine um so you know that's all pretty familiar um it's the connection stuff that gets kind of weird now when you start a server um it is then typically well, okay. It may or may not be broadcast visible on the LAN. And um, so that's something that you, um, I, I'm going to get to that in a second. Um, you're going to want the capabilities of sending a global message and sending messages just to specific players. That's definitely needed. Um, I have a bool override for send directly to self on the server here so that it's if the uh, excuse me if the server is sending uh to a specific player and that player happens to be the person on the server uh blues the post and she's sending a message you know without knowing it and it's supposed to go to herself then it just goes to herself locally and it goes straight on to client receiving data rather than going through all the rest of this. Um, for your debugging purposes, if you want to, you can of course just go in and make it not send directly to self and you know go through all the rigmarole as if it was a um, server, uh, as if it was a uh, you know discrete client, essentially. Um, all of this stuff in here this start sending data and the message split size and all this stuff. <laughs> this is all stuff to work around bugs in Lidgren. Um, and so this message split parts and all that jazz, uh, and sleeping the thread for a little while, three milliseconds, you know, all of that is stuff that you don't need to do. Um, you definitely will want to obviously catch the exceptions that are bound to happen because there are some legitimate ex uh, exceptions that get thrown to indicate networking problems and those shouldn't crash the game. Um, depending on the network library, you'll find out what those are. Um, on the client, this is almost identical to the server, 
Um, you can practically, you can pretty much wrap these into one wrapper if you wanted to, because so much is identical in most games. Um, but the server discovery thing is one thing that's not. And what that is doing in this particular case is it sends out a broadcast message on the local area network um, where on a given port, it sends out a hello, hello, hello on a given interval for a certain amount of time. And then if something answers, then we do something. Now, the uh, discovery status check thing here was just me calling this from the GUI loop on the find land games window so that it could blink the message and then yeah, this this has GUI code logic in in the network client wrapper. I'm really sorry about that. But I mean yeah, every two hundred milliseconds it's blinking the code via some stuff in here. And then it's also got stuff to say when it actually finds the server, put it on over. If it doesn't find any then you know, it's timed out and it and it says, oh, sorry, there's nothing. Um, and so on the client, um, there's a net message type server discovered. And that's calling here. And basically it says, all I'm going to do is read the IP endpoint. And I'm going to get the address of that uh, IP endpoint. I think that's built into .NET. Um, believe that's a dot net thing yep um so that's a that's a base dot net thing and you can um represent an ip address as either a long or a string um and uh, uh or, or an array of bytes it's like and so um it's pulling the address out of there, and it'll be in the format like 192.168.0.1 or whatever. And that's the server it found. And it says, hey, I found 192.1 dice, blah, blah, blah. And so then, boom, there, there it goes. And so the client's doing that. Beyond that, it's just handling all the same stuff. Um, it doesn't have messages to send stuff to all the um, other clients because each client is blind to all the other clients. The host talks to all the clients and has a connection with them. All the clients only have a connection with the host. So it's strongly recommended that the host be the person with the best network connection. Um, the host is going to have, if there's five people playing, the host is going to have uh, the full five people's worth of network data happening. And then each of the other four people are going to have um, one fifth of the amount of data, which is really nice because that makes it so that um, people that have really different levels of quality in their network uh, can still play together. You just have the person with a better one um, uh, be the be the host. Uh, that makes the really large multiplayer games from a base networking standpoint a lot more feasible um, obviously the, the game is a whole other matter but um you know from the underlying network standpoint uh it it chops stuff up pretty nicely so this here this is actually uh figuring out some remote um the actual address of the uh, server and is this a literal valid one? Some other stuff that I think a lot of this. So one of the things that can happen in a game in general, and just kind of because of my background at the time of creating this, I was paranoid about it, and clearly Michael Ligrin was as well. Is that um, what happens when a random string of gibberish gets thrown into that port? Um, it just some mess gets thrown into the the port that is open. Um, now that could happen um, quasi legitimately from a port scan, which could be happening at any given time. Particularly if you've got port forwarding on, you could just get port scanned at random by whatever hacker or whoever, and some stuff gets thrown in, and then you have a random crash because um because data that makes no sense 
to the network library suddenly appears. Um, that could also happen much more targeted maliciously if you know the game was way more popular, it's League of Legends or something, and so so and so knows that you know the IP address of X player is you know IPA, then they uh, know what the port is, and then every so often they just troll that League of Legends player by sending some garbage to the League of Legends port on uh, IPA. And if League of Legends didn't know how to handle that, then it would just barf and die uh, every time it did it. And if they were really going to be nasty about it, then they could start sending, you know, messages from another client that is um, like from a fake client, basically, that is um, um, spoofing information about, you know, its IP endpoint, its, you know, sending you know commands that don't make a whole lot of sense but that the game tries to execute and then it dies blah blah blah. so there's some really basic hardening that just goes in against things that are both unlikely to happen and fairly regularly happen if you've got a port open to the internet um in the grand scheme regularly uh and so with those it's basically if data arrives that makes no sense to me or that's not from somebody that uh, that I'm connected with or want to be connected with, then just check it out and don't even tell the player because they don't need to know every time they get port scanned. It happens all the time. And that's just life. <laughs> um, welcome to the internet. You know, yeah. So... Um, in this particular case, again, here, this is data that this this is um, stuff that you don't need to do, that this was working around a um, Lidgren bug where it was reconstructing data on the client side. This is a good example of me doing, um, you know how you didn't understand exactly what I was doing, and so you rebuilt the same thing on top of what I'd been doing? Well, I didn't quite understand what Lidgren was doing wrong, and so I just rebuilt what he'd been doing on top of what he was doing. So we had at least, like, five layers of that by the time we got to, you know, the last federation or something. Um, so, yeah, fun. Um, none of that should should need to happen. Uh, the game run status, um, you know, there's some low uh, logic in there that I put in. It's like, hey, if we de detect that we're not um, connected, then try to reconnect, you know, and remember what the last server was and some other things like that. Um, that's fairly straightforward stuff. Um, one of the things to know is that typically a client can connect to a server, but a server can't reconnect to a client so if a client disappears it's the client's job to get back with the server and it's the server's job to wait um also ideally it's the server's job to say everybody else bob z is missing uh we're gonna wait for him for a little bit and then we'll decide what to do and um if um uh, if the host if the server goes offline then all the clients of course are going ah i'm disconnected um i need to reconnect the host when it comes back online will be open on that port again and the clients will successfully reconnect um generally speaking but again the host did not reach out it just made itself available and people came to it you know if you build it it will come it will come uh so so that was um, helpful. These things here send the messages to the server. You know, this, um, these uh, network message type things here are mine. That's my layer of stuff for like showing how far along we are in the progress of loading something, how we are in, you know, a whole bunch of things that are really, 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 really game specific and that you don't need to even try and investigate to recreate because you can do a better job yourself. Um, you know, the game command stuff here, yeah, it's just 
all this stuff. You've you've already built all that for this new game anyway. So uh, overall, um, overall, your concerns are going to be server makes itself available, client makes itself uh, on and tries to connect to a server. They talk to each other and say, are you allowed to be my friend or get out of here? And then they send each other data and, you know, they identify the, the client knows who the host is. The host is the host. There is only one host, you know, so the client doesn't really need to know anything beyond that. It's simpler. It's a simpler time if you're a client. It's just like, you know, I send the data to the, the host. That's it. And, you know, for the client, for the host itself, though, it needs to know, it's like, well, there's in this to all the clients or which client, who is this client, you know, um, even when the um, clients are sending something that's player specific, like if I wanted to, you know, in a game sense, whisper something to you, it would go through Blue's machine and um, it, Blue's machine would be the one that's like, okay, show this to Keith, but not Blue, you know, whatever. Um, so, um, so there's no direct knowledge, you know, I would be quote, whispering to you based off of your username. I wouldn't know your IP address by design. And I also wouldn't know your, um, connection index on the host. Only the host knows those sort of things because the host winds up knowing everything host knows their own IP address, everybody else's IP address, their connection index on the host, their usernames, blah, 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 blah. Um, everybody else pretty much just knows the host, um, which is nice because it minimizes the amount of data exposure from any particular side. Um, the, um, it's actually also really nice for LANs of certain kinds of land when you've got two people on a land that are connected to a third person outside a land it actually is really nice because you can actually do that because thanks to the way that um um if nat port for nat punch through is working properly then um if you and i were both in an office and we were communicating with um blue and eric and um, they were each in their own separate states, but you and I were in one physical location together behind one firewall, therefore giving us one same public IP address of that firewall, then we could both get our individual messages from the host, say Blue still, and um, we would individually be communicating with Blue, Eric would be individually communicating with Blue, and Blue would be sending back messages to all of us. And since these are client-initiated messages, the firewalls are actually smart enough now to route it to the correct um, client on the inside. So you or me, uh, even though we're both having the same public IP address, it can tell what the conversation is, which is really, 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 really nice. Um, and so that's one of the nice things about NAT punch through is that when you, once you've established NAT punch through, um it's basically establishing my conversation with blue the server and then your conversation with blue the server and then um from then on out we can talk back and forth um fairly straightforwardly and that's really helpful not only because it require doesn't require port forwarding but also because um if you and i are in a shared office environment behind a single public ip address Convert, you know, we can both play with people outside of that network, which used to not be a thing. Like in the mid 2000s, that really didn't work well. Um, you had to put one of them on a VPN or something because our public IP is the same. And there, that was all the identification there was, and that's no longer the case. So, um, at any rate, find people on the local network, uh, find servers on the local, local network. Do the connection, do the NAT punch through, actually send some data back and forth, and bada bing, bada boom, you're pretty much done. There's a whole bunch of other stuff that these networking libraries support that we don't care about because it's for actual game logic, but it's for like, you know, making sure that physics lines up between the games or, you know, that, you know, that there's, you know, shot prediction and stuff like that for 
bullets that are moving. And those are all super useful things, but not to AI war. So um, it's actually a lot simpler than the code makes it look. And um, um, hopefully that is absolutely everything I can think to tell you. So uh, thanks for watching.